Statistics, birthday probability game. Get ready and some coffee because it's time to get realistic with statistics. And once we get realistic, no one's holding me back, man. Unless maybe they're giving me back a massage. But once the kinks are worked out, best let go because no one's holding me back. You're not required to, but if you have access to this OneNote file, we're currently in the first, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever, because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunchy numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. One note presentation section 1820 birthday probability game tab. We're considering the concepts of probability as a subsection or part of the broader topic of statistics. This time looking at certain situations where our intuition, our gut can lead us astray quite predictively with different areas or components related to probability. So the idea here is it's not just you, it's not just me. Predictively, human beings' intuition goes astray with certain components related to probability, which are important to be able to identify because they'll lead us to incorrect decisions if we just follow our gut and if we can recognize these areas, we can then create more formal systems to make those types of decisions. These are also areas where we can be basically tricked. So a lot of times when you're looking at con artists or you're looking at magic trick type of games, they will take advantage of, of these kind of inconsistencies with regards to our intuition. So one uh, game that's kind of fun to look at that kind of points this out is this birthday game. The idea being that if you have, let's say more than 50 people in the room, because we're gonna have the odds will be pretty high. If you have more than 50 people in a room, you can ask people, what is the likelihood that at least two people in this room will have the same birthday? Now we're not talking about the same year. We're just talking about the same day in the year. And typically, when we just think about our intuition, it seems like that's going to be fairly unlikely to happen because there's a lot of days in the year and there's only like 50 or so people in the room. But in actuality, there's a very, very, very high likelihood that that will indeed be the case. And that's just one example where kind of our intuition runs astray and it's kind of a fun game uh, that you can play in like a meeting uh, type of uh, situation. Another area where our intuition often is incorrect is with regards to randomness. If you were to just plot random points on the screen, for example, here, then usually if a human being was doing it, they imagine randomness to be equally spaced apart. They would put the dots more spaced apart. Whereas if you randomly generate something on the screen, you're going to get something closer to what you look like in, in when you look at the stars in the sky and you see some stars that are quite clustered together. It's not like they're evenly spaced apart. Evenly spaced apart looks like a human being set up like a, like a little thing there, right? We want it symmetrical and everything spaced apart and we think that's random. That's not random. Random's going to have little clumps and stuff that's going to be happening. Same when, when you think about a series of heads and tails or true false questions, then oftentimes if you have a long series of heads and tails or red and black on a roulette wheel, you will have long strings of red or black. Ten, ten long string of red or black. That looks like it should not be the case in our intuition. We would say, man, something's got to be wrong with that roulette wheel. Something's got to be wrong with that coin. But true randomness will end up with these long strings, even though a coin will over the long run have about 50, 50 
you know, over the long term of a bunch of different flips. All right. Now, first, in order to approach this question, we're going to do another very common thing with regards to mathematics in general. We'll say this bigger problem, can I mirror it with a more simplified type of problem? And this is kind of a deconstruction method, a method that is quite useful for many kind of engineering things, mathematical things. We can break something down to its component point parts and then put it back together. Doesn't work for everything because sometimes the whole is more than the parts and so on and so forth. And you have complexity that takes place. But with many things, that's a great, great way to figure things out. We can say, how can I get a, a more simple problem? So first, we're going to consider this dice problem. And then we'll see how it relates to, uh, to the problem that we are looking at. So let's imagine we have three die. We've got a red, a yellow, and a, a green die. And we're trying to figure out the likelihood that at least two of the dice are going to have the same number on it. You can see the similarity between this game and having multiple people and all have the same birthday. But now we only have the three dice. Now, of course, the three dice, they only have six numbers each. So if we had like the first die, the red die, if we roll the red die, let's say we get a four, then the question is, if we roll the next die that we can start to think, or we could roll them at the same time, it would be a similar thing because they're independent. We can start to think of what's the likelihood then of the second die having a four and what's the likelihood of, of the third die having a two or a four. This is one way that we might structure our thought process. So let's imagine this. We're going to say, all right, we have three dice with uh, two matches. Um, so, so, the first roll, we're going to say it is what it is. It is. It could be whatever the first roll is, one out of six. It doesn't matter because we're trying to look at these second two rolls and the likelihood that they're going to be the same or different than the first roll. Now, it turns out that it's actually a little bit easier on, on this strategy to try to, to try to figure out the, the likelihood that you're going to have uh, none of them matching and then take the complement to have them match. So we've seen this strategy in a prior problem uh, as well. Similar kind of strategy here. We're going to say, okay, what's, what's going to be the scenario where none of them match? Well, okay, we can analyze this one at a time. We could say, all right, if we have the first dice is a four, we say it is what it is. Uh, and then the second dice that we roll, what's the likelihood that it doesn't come up to be the same? It's got to be something different. Well, the likelihood we have anything other than a four is five out of the potential six options. Let's say it was a two. So, so then the third dice, then we have the similar kind of thing. We're going to roll the green dice now. And now it cannot be either a two or a six. That's two out of six options that we do not want it to hit. If we want it to be something different, six minus two is four. Therefore, we have four options out of the total six because it's an even die that uh, we don't match one of the other two options. Obviously, if we divide these out, we can turn them into a percent. So five over six is going to be 0.833 or 83%. We've got the 4 over 6, which is going to be the 0.66 or about 66.67%. Uh, so, so then we can say these are going to be independent. So we have to take the product of, of them. So obviously the odds are going to be smaller. We're not going to be adding uh, them together. And if we multiply together a fraction or a decimal or a percent that's less than 100%, we're going to get something uh, that's going to be smaller, right? So I can take this 0 0.8333 uh, about times 0 0.66. Oh, wait a sec. Did I do that right? Yeah. 0 0.8333 times 0 0.6667. And we get about the 55.55. So 55.55. There we have it. And then I can say, okay, what's going to be the complement of that? Well, the, the other option is that we do have a match. So 55% of the time, 55.55, uh, we have no match. Minus 100% means that there is some match that's going to be happening, which will be 44.44% of the time. So that's how we, we took the complement to get there. Now, you might say, it's a little bit more complicated than you would think at first. We're not going to go into it in detail, but you might say it would be nice 
if I can also calculate it the other way, because uh, that gives me kind of like a check figure, if I can roll the second dice and figure out the other way. So you might say, hey, look, if I roll the first die, it's a four. Why can't I just say if I roll the second die, I have a one out of four, one out of six chance to hit that first four, which would be 16.67. And then the second die, you would think that I have a two out of six chance to roll one of those two numbers, which would be two out of six or 33% uh, chance. And if I multiply them together, I, I get this and and it doesn't match. So, so notice that that doesn't match uh, what we would expect it to be, which would be that. So, so now we're saying, okay, that didn't work, right? Because those two, if they were complements, those two strategies would have to work. So that's why this strategy is a little bit more complex than, than doing the strategy that we took up top. So, so now I can say, okay, well, I'm not entirely satisfied uh, with that possibly because I would like those two to kind of line up so I can see both sides. So why don't I test uh, both of them now and see if I can, I can, this is the difference, do like an empirical test. So we're gonna imagine that we're in Excel and say, could I set up a system where I actually roll the dice that three different dice, a red, yellow, and green one, and count the results and see if I come up with a result that matches one of these two scenarios. And it's gonna be, you know, this top one here is gonna be the, the one that we get to, right? So if we did that in Excel, we could say, all right, let's do a count. I'm gonna roll it, I'm gonna do 500 of these rolls. Imagining we roll three dice. So we're just gonna tell Excel, this is gonna be what we want you to do, a random number generation, the bottom number being one, the top number being six. So we have the red, yellow, and green dice. We just told Excel to give me a random number between one and six for each of those dice. And we told Excel to do that 500 times, right? So I didn't put all 500 here, but we're gonna imagine Excel did it 500 times. That's the idea. So now with this count column, we're using this formula. So what I wanna see is I wanna say, okay, between the red, yellow, and the green dice, I want you to tell me every time there's a match, meaning two, at least two of these are, are matching together. So this one, we had no match, uh, no match. This one has a four and a four, so there's a match, and so, and so on and so forth. How could I do that with a formula? So I could say, this is a formula that I'm putting in here. We're gonna say uh, count if, and I'm taking, I, I would like to take the first uh, two, or the, I'm sorry, I took these two and said, I want that to be my range, the second two, and I want you to count it if the criteria is the first one, okay? And then I added to it. So that means that if there was, uh, a five and a five this way or a five and a five that way those two either of those two matched it would pick it up but it wouldn't pick up if these two matched so then i added to it another count if with the range of the first two needs to match this one that's going to be the criteria so so that means that if none of them match it's going to give me a zero but if they do match i could get a two i can get a one i could get a four and all I'm looking for is anything, anytime there's a match. So anytime there's any number over here with this formula, that means there was some kind of match. So here we didn't have any match. Here we had two threes, there's a match. There's two fours, that's a match. This one had the two fives on this side. I only got a one, but it's still a match. Whether it's a two or a one, I have a match. This one has three of the kind and it gives me a four because it matched you know, this side and this side but I'm okay with that as long as there's a match because I'm looking for just a match. All right, so once I have that, we can go over here and say, all right, then what we wanna do is count them. So I'm gonna be counting all the ones that had a match. How can I do that? Well, I could use a count formula and say count if this column, all the ones that have a match are gonna have an amount, the range of that column, that's gonna be greater than zero. Now this formula is a little bit tricky because it says greater than zero. I have the quotations because that's a text. And then I have to tie it to any text. I have to tie it to the zero. We'll get into that. If you want to look at those formula, we did this in Excel in another course or section, which you can dive into if you want to. This will just be the overcap. And then this one, 
Instead of just saying I could have said 500 minus this number would be the difference, but I'd like to double check it. So I'm going to do another count if and take this range and say, just give me that range if it comes out to be a zero. And it counted 281. My double check then is the, is the sum of those 219 plus 281. That should be 500 because we did this 500 times. So it looks like that is correct. So now I'm going to say, all right, there's the matches. Uh, the rules were going to be 500. So the percentages that we get then is going to be 219 over 500, which is about 43.8%. And then this one was 281 over 500, which is about 56.2%. And obviously, if we add those to together, 43.8 plus 56.2, we get the 100%. These are rounded. That's why it's not exact right there. So the estimates that we came out to, you will recall over here and say, does that work? Well, if I look over here, I said it was 44% uh, percent for the match and 55% uh, for for the no match, right? So, so that looks pretty close. So if I go over here, what it actually happened when I ruled it 500 times, we had a difference of the 40, uh, 4380 minus the 44 here and here. So I feel like we kind of empirically tested that and said, okay, this, this result looks like, uh, it's, a like it's the correct result because we tested it. If we ran this in Excel, we can shuffle these numbers a bunch of times and we would expect these two numbers to shuffle between positive and negative if we've got that center point uh, correct. So once we have that concept down, then we could say, all right, let's apply this to the same theory, the same idea to the birthday problem. So let's imagine we have 50 people in a room and we say, okay, what's the likelihood that uh, at least two people have the same birthday? We're not talking about the, the uh, year, just the days in the year. So we could say, all right, well, same concept the first person as though we're going to ask them one at a time is 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 the birthday is whatever it is let's say it was january 15th when we ask the second person then what's the likelihood that it does not match the first person because what we're looking for is first just like we did with the dice the scenario which is easier is to say let me think about the scenario where nobody matches and then and then take the complement of that, right? And then take the different, you know, minus 100 and take that. So if we say 366 days, depends on the year you're in, right? But I'm going to imagine a year with 366 or 365, you can do a similar, it's going to come out to a similar calculate, right? So the second one has 365 days. And then the third person that we ask, well, now let's say the first person had a birthday on January 15th. The second one had a birthday on March 8th or something. Those are only two days out of 300 and uh, out of now 366 days. That So that means that 364 days would not match out of the total days in the year of 366. If we ask the next person which is now, you know, the, the fourth person, the first three, we already got their birthdays. We have three different dates already taken. That means that 366 minus those three dates gives us 363 days out of the total 366. These are the, the percentages, of course. Uh, we say if I took the 365 over the 366, we get about 99 0.7 and so on. And then if we go to the next person, we're going to say now the next person we had one, two, three, four people, four days have been taken up minus 366 days means that we could still have 362 days out of 366 where they where they wouldn't hit, right? And we can do this going all the way out and to our 50 people. So we had 50 people. When I get back to the 50th person, now we have 366 days, 49 of those days have already been taken. Therefore, we have 317 days out of 366. Okay, so there, so here are all of our uh, percentages for the calculation. And what we would have to do is take then the product of all of these items. So you could take 
the sum of the numerator divided, you know, the product of the of the numerator divided by the denominator, or multiply all of these percentages, which of course is something a lot easier to do in Excel. Fifty of them. I won't do it in the calculator calculator here, but this times this times this times this times this times this times this, and that's going to give you the point two nine nine percent. So the like that that tells us that the likelihood of none of the birthdays uh, matching is pretty low, only 2.99%. Now we take the complement of that minus 100% means that there's a 97.01% chance that at least two people will have a birthday that matches. So that's pretty high. You can work it out as well with people less than 50 people in a room and you'll still be have a, you know, you still could have a pretty high uh, estimate, but you can see with 50 people in a room, you're you're near guaranteed that you're going to have like at least one match of the birthday, not counting the year, but uh, just the day. Now you might say, okay, how could I test that like in Excel? Like that's interesting. Could I run some scenarios to kind of empirically test that? Well, we could say, all right, well, let's let's say that we take the dates in the year. I could list out the dates, January 1st, let's say 2024, and then just take one more day up all the way down for all the days in the year. And I can then give every day a number, one through 365 or 366, right? So in other words, January through January 31st is 31 days. Instead of starting over on February at one, we're just going to start at day 32, right? And then we just go on up. So we're listing all of the days in the year and assigning them a number going all the way up to uh, just uh, 1231, which in the year of 2024 is 366 days in the year. So then once we have that, we could then run uh, basically our scenarios here, which is saying, I want to, I want you Excel to give me a random generation between uh, numbers one and 366 representing the days in the year. These column then, which is going to be our 50 people, represents the 50 people that we're going to then repeat. So we have our column of 50 people. And then the question is, well, now I'm looking for matches. Once I get this randomly generated number representing random birthdays of random 50 people, groups of 50, then I have to find the match. That's a little bit kind of tricky in Excel to do, but you could do a conditional formatting, taking this column and saying, make it red if there's a duplicate. That's one way that you can just find the duplicates. So notice I could see here, anytime there's red, that means that there's a duplicate. So there's 366, 355, 58, there's, there's the 361, there's the 355, there's the 58. So there were three people that had the same birthday. This one, we did the same thing. We ran another 50 people. And anytime there's a green one, there was a match. This time there were only one match, 132 that had the same birthday, but we still had a match there. This was the third time we ran it. There's a couple matches, 142, uh, uh, 142. There's a bunch of matches here. The, one thir the 131, uh, which matches this 131, the 316, and the 316, the 165, and the 165. So there's a bunch of people that had the same birthdays on that one. This one had the matches 355 and the 355 and so on. And if our calculation is correct over here, we should very rarely have any event where, where there's not a color in the column, right? Each of these columns has some color in it which represents that we have at least one match if I populated this correctly. So that's one way we can kind of empirically test this and say, okay, you could set this up in Excel and say, all right, every column has some color in it. And so there it is all the way across. And then you could replicate this because in Excel, these numbers, you could shuffle them. So this column, oh, it still has one. Yeah, still has a... So then you can shuffle them and say, how many times do I have to shuffle them in order to find in order to find one whole column that doesn't have any match, which you would think would happen fairly rarely, given the fact that 90, it's only going to happen two point about 3% of the time, right? 
So that's one way that you can kind of test this out in Excel and kind of uh, play with Excel and uh, try to get the concept in your mind a bit because again, it does look somewhat intuitively, you wouldn't think so intuitively that it would be such a high. So, uh, so that's, the, that's the idea. So sometimes with probability, with regards to randomness and with regards to some probabilities and expected value calculations, therefore, our intuition can lead us in the wrong direction. And if we know that, then we can train our intuition on certain on those on those kinds of things to at least be closer. But uh, even if we're not doing that, what we can do is we can then say, "Hey, look, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play this game when I know that my intuition is <laughs> is gonna be incorrect. I'm gonna set up a more formal decision making process so that so that I can have a logical thought process taking into consideration the fact that I know my gut." is going to be wrong if it hasn't been trained for decisions in those particular circumstances.